So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, August the 4th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 218. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here, that you made it through the week, first Friday in August. Too bad. I'm so happy I'm not going back to school. Remember those days? Anyway, uh, what's it doing outside? This is... Uh, going to be 76.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which in Celsius is 25 degrees. 1.3 mile per hour wind, so easy going, nice and laid back. 69% relative humidity, so the humidity is up. Last night, all my bees were bearding. Every single hive had bees clustered on the outside of it. Why? Because the goldenrod is blooming. And asters, of course, have been blooming, but the nectar flow is on, so... We have to get a lot of information out here. Also, we're still getting the effects from the Canadian forest fires. That's right. 69 parts per million today, which puts us in the yellow zone, which means if you're at all challenged or compromised or whatever, you can't be outside running around because those particulates are going to settle in your chest, in your lungs, and it's not good for you. So what else is going on? Uh, if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you're going to see every topic listed in order. You will also see a link that will take you to my website, which is thewaytobe.org. And there's a page, The Way to Be. You can fill out a form and submit your own topics. So the things that we're going to talk about today are um, based on questions submitted by viewers like you over the past week. So what else is going on before I get started here? The opening sequences, by the way. My wife feeds uh, Baltimore Orioles in our backyard at a feeder, and she puts grape jelly out there. But guess what's going on? The bees are intensely scouring the countryside looking for anything that's sweet. And of course, they hijacked her Oriole feeders. So my suggestion to her is you have to stop feeding the Orioles. That's right. Or you could put your feet out after sunset because the Orioles do come around at that time. But once the sunrise happens and the scouts get out there, they're going to go to known sources right away and they're mobbing anything sweet. So I really hope that if I have neighbors that are keeping Oriole feeders out and things like that, I hope my bees aren't all over them. But uh, what else? The other thing is I got an alert, uh, an urgent message from one of my viewers who wanted to make sure that I let you know, or at least remind people, that if you're putting a feeder inside your beehive, and it's the tank style, so buckets, tank feeders, anything that, this is obviously not a feeder, but this is solidified honey. However, if you're using feeder jars with the little holes in them and you're putting that upside down in the upper part of your beehive, which is, by the way, where I prefer that you put it if you're going to keep your hive from being robbed, um, this stuff will push out the liquid on its own, by the way. We've had rapid temperature rises around here. So, for example, 40 degrees early in the morning and 80 to 81 by the afternoon. So you can imagine, you might think your bees are consuming resources when in reality, the gas that's trapped inside these tank style feeders, bucket style, this is a Bee Smart style feeder, which was the topic that she wanted me to talk about. There's a couple of them, different colors, but they look the same with a little spot on it. Looks harmless enough, but apparently, uh, she didn't make sure that the gasket was sealed. Inside of these, there is a gasket right here. And before you put any tank style feeder on your hive, I don't care if it's a bucket with a spud in it, inverted mason jar, whatever you're putting on there, make sure that you run the test first, fill it up with water, for example, because water is lighter than sugar syrup. So if you test it with water and it doesn't leak, you're probably pretty much good to go. But you can even cross thread them a little bit and not make good contact with the gasket. So I fill these up, set them on a pie plate, or you can put them on a cup or anything like that, and let it cycle through a couple of days and see what happens to it. And if it leaks out, as it did with the individual that wrote to me, uh, the tank leaked out all over. Where is this set on top of the hive, on top of your inner cover? Right dead center. Where's the brood? Right dead center. What happens if a bunch of syrup leaks out of this and goes all over the brood? It's going to kill it. Your bees can't keep up with it. 
Now, really strong, really large colonies, uh, they can keep up with it just fine, but those aren't the ones that you're feeding, are they? So, whenever you're using a feeder that has trapped air in it that could express out that liquid, test it first. And if you have problems with it, if it, if it doesn't seal no matter what, send your feeder back to whoever you bought it from, unless, of course, you've had it a few years, then you're going to have to uh, replace the gasket. Another hive top, inner cover feeder, bee buffet. That was the Bee Smart Designs tank right there. Holds over a gallon. The bee buffet, the bees come up through um, the center here. So this sits over the hole. They come up over the top. They feed here. You can swap out your jar without the bees getting in your business. Because look, there's a cover on it and the bees can't access that part. This style feeder also can leak in overwhelm the tray and then leak down inside if you're using feeders like these on your hive your hive has to be level now we like to tilt our hives towards the landing board during the winter time heavy rains and things like that to keep the water from washing into your hive there's another reason why i like you when you're taking honey and things like that i like you to tip your hives actually back instead of forward and that's because if any honey leaks out while you're pulling frames and things like that, uh, we want it to run to the back of your bottom board instead of the front of the entrance because once honey hits that entrance, foraging bees show up. Next thing you know, you have a major robbing event on your hands. So what kind of feeders would not leak at all? Rapid rounds don't leak. This one, see it sticks out a little bit underneath? So you can put, uh, I use, canning gaskets and I just set that down and set this on that and then this goes over the center hole and you can put liquid feed on these now here's the thing the bees often come out uh, underneath of this cup right here and they can get into the free surface area of your syrup and they can drown because sometimes this gets moved around and it floats away a little bit this is in place for liquid feeding now so what I've started doing is tack welding it a little bit only with uh, gorilla glue so hot glue i just put little tabs on it holds this down make sure that stays in place and your bees don't get out and drown so that's for liquid feeding and it will not express itself out into your hive the way the tank style or trap style feeders do that have an enclosed air gap in them so that's another one that feeds really well and the only thing I'm putting the feed on is uh, tiny nukes and things like that that need help. There were only two of the colonies over the past week. Uh, when I'm looking at all the landing board activity uh, this past week, the switch really turned on. All the bees are busy. They are bringing in abundant amounts of pollen, and that's good because we have a pollen test coming up around here. The corn is starting to tassel, and we're going to collect pollen for two days and we're sending it off for analysis. We're going to find out how toxic the pollen is. And I just got a message from them too, uh, requesting that I also test uh, and collect plant parts that are adjacent to the cornfield um, because they also want to know if the systemic pesticides that are in use for the corn is also leaching into the soil and also being picked up by adjacent plants. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. And uh, of course, I'll share that with you. And what else is going on? But there were two colonies that were very slow. Not much going on, not much going on on the landing board. And I realized that, well, they might have lost their queen. So grandson was here. He wanted to make sure that we did some stuff with the bees. So uh, we pointed out all the differences in the hives and the one that had the least activity should get our attention. We also supered some hives. But uh, sure enough, there's a queen, a laying queen. There were workers, everything in there. They're just small. And what happens when a colony is small? There's kind of a general rule. You're not going to get in there and count your bees, but 5,000 bees or more can multitask. So that means uh, we've had cooler nights recently and things like that. So when the bees are demonstrating a priority towards the brood, which they do, so they're feeding their brood, they're warming their brood, and they're preserving their brood. That's the colony's future. They're also preserving the queen. Um, when they do that, and if we have cold, challenging days and not a lot of resources in the environment, which up until the past few days, uh, we were in a semi-dearth period, so the bees were challenged. 
And uh, by putting on some sugar syrup on that colony, they're not going to be supered. We're not pulling any honey off of those colonies this year. They're just too small. So what would happen then is we provide sugar syrup. That gives them the sucrose and energy that they need. And then that means fewer bees have to go out while the rest stay back and babysit, so to speak. So now they can all focus their energies inside the hive day and night. And then that frees them up from foraging for nectar. So you're providing a little bit of a supplement there. Otherwise, those colonies would continue to decline. Uh, their brood is not going to expand because if the brood stays the same size, they have to be producing at least the same number of worker bees that they're losing through old age and foraging activities, right? So if that colony does not produce more brood than it's losing on a daily basis, then ultimately, even though brood is present, even though there's a queen, they're kind of in a dead spiral where they're just going to continue to dwindle down until they just won't have what they need. Also, they need to defend themselves on their landing boards, and that's because uh, things are about to get heavy around here when the robbers come. So robbing is coming. And so they're boosted now. They were very active. So there's a lot more going on that can save that colony of bees. The other option would have been to combine them. But with a laying queen, I kind of like to play with the underdogs a little bit. So let's get going with today's stuff. Uh, I think that's about it. First question comes from Giles from New York. I see a lot of beekeepers freely swapping resources from one hive to another. Is there no concern about disease or parasite cross-contamination? That's a very good question. And here's the thing about that. Uh, I know I've mentioned in the past that I like to leave hive tools are cheap. The little flat ones with a little J hook on the side. And uh, I like to leave a hive tool under every cover. That's both convenient and it prevents the spread of disease. So when we're doing coursework at, uh, through Cornell, through the DICE lab, uh, it was recommended that you sanitize your gear. At first, they said between hives, but then that didn't seem very practical. You're not going to stop and torch and clean your hive tool between every hive. So what we did decide was that you would clean or replace or have different tools, including your smoker and everything else, when you go to a different apiary. So if you've got multiple out yards, you would have a different one for every out yard you go to. And the whole point is not to spread contamination as described here. Uh, particularly too, you're going to help out a friend or something, have a visitor kit set aside that uh, you use only when you're going away because it goes both ways. You don't want to go out there, do an inspection of a colony and find out they had foul brood or something and then come back with those tools and forget, just have them in your kit and then go right to work on your own hives you potentially spread that around because you've got beeswax, sometimes honey, and other materials from those hives still on your hive tool. So you don't have to look very far to see that people are not cleaning their tools. So the other part of that is understanding when a colony is in trouble. And so looking at your brood areas in particular, those are kind of uh, the indicators of what's going on in the hive overall. And uh, so this is part of it. If you have healthy colonies and it's all in the same bee yard, okay, so the same backyard apiary, you have so much of an exchange going on already through bee drift. The drones are going to any hive they want to go to. Often workers are landing on the wrong landing boards and going right in because they have resources that they've gathered from the environment and they take them in and they're welcome. So there is a lot of cross-contamination already going on. And does that mean it doesn't matter if we're swapping hive, and hive equipment, comb and frames and things like that. Well, if your colonies are healthy and if your brood frames look good, a lot of new beekeepers may not recognize brood disease. So I highly recommend you get that little handout book called Honeybees and Their Maladies. So if you just do a quick Google search for that, you'll find it. It's a pocket-sized pamphlet. I handed out a bunch of them over the past couple of weeks uh, because it's a great visual guide. You don't always have your bee mentor there with you if you're in your first year of beekeeping. And you might just be looking at the brood and wondering, huh, it just doesn't look right. It looks a little dark. The, cap, the caps are a little concave. It looks a little greasy. Maybe there's tiny holes in the cell caps. And uh, those visual guides will help you. And then if you think you've got a problem, it also includes guidelines on how to test for that. 
So there are test kits for American Fowl Brood and European Fowl Brood, and they're very inexpensive. I highly recommend you have a couple of those in your bee kit, because then if you have suspicions about a hive, you can test them yourself. It's very easy, very straightforward. I've done videos that showed you how to do that. And if you want to see one, I can give you a link. But uh, so I say within your own apiary, swapping frames, uh, hive to hive is very common. And I don't see a problem with it because you would think most of your bees, if not all of them are healthy as far as things like that go. So I think you're fine with that. And uh, with no concern about disease or parasite cross-contamination, you definitely don't want to be transferring Barota structure mites to another colony, but usually what's happening is we're exchanging frames of brood. You know what a healthy uh, pattern of brood looks like, a good consistent pattern, not a bunch of empty spaces and empty cells. You look for little particulates in the cells that might indicate that there's fecal matter from your Barota destructor mites. So if everything looks good, and if you've seen a lot of colonies that are healthy, swapping those resources and fortifying another colony, that's something I could have done with that nucleus hive that I just put sugar syrup on. I could have, sure, taken a frame of brood, capped brood, and put that in with them, and that would provide them with five to 6,000 new workers within the next couple of weeks. So there are a lot of ways to do it. I just chose to put sugar syrup on there because I know they're gonna kick off on their own. But to answer Giles' um, question here, I don't think there's much of a problem, but you do need to be aware of real issues with beehives. And if you're not comfortable, a pocket guide, or maybe get your mentor or some experienced, more experienced beekeeper out to look at your stuff. Question number two comes from Ryan from Seguin, Seguin, S-E-G-U-I-N, Texas. Wonder if you can provide some tactics, techniques, and procedures for conducting hive inspections during dearth. Okay, so first of all, some of you may be wondering, what is a dearth anyway? Well, a dearth means that what your bees need in the environment is not being provided. So maybe you haven't had a lot of rain. Maybe this year you had some problems with your crops. Like for example, normally this time of year, I would have thousands of sunflowers in my lower field. I have probably three right now. Why? because I have deer grazing in that field every single night and there's a doe with her fawns and she's teaching them all what to eat. And what are they doing? They're eating the tops off of every single sunflower. So they created a sunflower dearth, but the good news is they didn't eat all the spreading dogbane, which is pollen and nectar for the bees. They didn't eat all of my cosmos flowers, which I planted thousands of those because this is gonna be the late forage they didn't seem to eat the Maximilian sunflowers, which are also going to be late season forage, pollen and nectar. So I was disappointed about that. But if you have a dearth and your bees can't get what they need, they turn to robbing. So particularly these large colonies. So if you've got a colony that's really desperate for resources, they're putting thousands of foragers into the air. And what are they looking for? Any sweet nectar or sugar, that they can get a hold of. I don't care if it's a jar of can of soda or something that somebody left out and you go to take a drink and you drink in a bee. Somebody was just here last night and she said that she had just done that, drank in a bee and spit it out quick, did not get stung, but that's interesting. I've had bees fly into my coffee. And yes, I put sugar in my coffee. So when you go out to your hive, I have a lot to say about this um, because right now, uh, even though they're bringing in massive resources. Uh, all of the goldenrod is not in bloom yet. We're just at the leading edge of it, which is really good. This is gonna be a really strong nectar flow, I can tell already. Today is also the first time I've ever seen bees working on Queen Anne's lace, but they're not sticking their tongues out at all. So if they're not sticking out their tongue, what they're on the flower for is pollen alone. So what they do is they're scurrying across the surface of it as fast as they can, rubbing as much of their body on it as they can, to gather the pollen. And sure enough, I looked at their hind legs and they do have light brown pollen on their corbicula. So they're getting pollen, first time I've ever seen it, on Queen Anne's lace. So there you go. Good reason not to mow that stuff down. But when you go out to inspect your hives, there are things to, uh, to uh, consider. So I'm going to give you a bunch of ideas. Some of them, some of you will not like. You might think it's cheesy. Uh, others might want to try it out. I uh, don't like to get my bees robbed. 
one of the first things when you go to open a hive, right? So now other times of the year, I use sugar syrup on a hot day. So if there's a lot going on and we don't uh, seem to have a problem with defensiveness from a, a hive and stuff like that, a little one-to-one -one sugar syrup can occupy them. Light sugar syrup, they drink it right away. It's not gonna go into their supers and things like that. It also, because I give little spritzes of that to the center frames, they move away from the outside edges onto the center frames and get that uh, sugar syrup. So that gets them out of the way so I can put my boxes back together. So the very first thing, smoke your hives lightly at the front. Of course, you pull the outside cover off. Now you're at the inner cover, which you're probably going to have to pry off. Uh, that's because it's going to have propolis on it and it's going to be sealed down. Now, because the bees are in this strong nectar flow, they have this habit of building comb over the top of the frame and attaching it to the underside of your inner cover. So when you pull that apart, what happens? You just expose uh, cells that have honey in it that's probably not even capped yet, but any honey that's up there, you're gonna pull it open. So even if it was capped, it's now exposed. The smell of honey goes into the air. There you are with your smoker puffing the bees off of those frames. And bees that are flying by get a whiff of that honey that you just exposed. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna zip right over there and land on it. They're gonna start feeding on it. That's why. Whenever we're doing hive inspections, you're going to see bees, preferably from the resident colony, licking up that honey. But here's what you can do to reduce the robbing or getting the attention of bees that are passing by. When you pull that, pry up that inner cover, and I always look underneath too to see if it's pulling frames with it, and then you stick your hive tool in, you pry the frames apart, right? So you push the frames down, and then you close it. You want to do this on a nice hot day because we want the propolis and we want the beeswax to be soft and easier to work with. We don't want to pull our frames apart. So once you pry that up and break those seals and give it a little twist, right? Put it right back in place. Then you go to your next box down because most of us are going to pull at least one super off. So then you pry that up, same thing. Light puffs of smoke in there as soon as you crack it open and look in to see if any of the frames are being pulled up with the beeswax again. And then you stick your hive tool in there and you pry those down. This is why I like to use two hive tools at once. One pries it up, one does the work. I always have two hive tools. Then once I pry those down, what else did I do? I just disrupted potentially a bunch of uh, honey that's stored in those cells and it's gonna leak around. So that's step two, give that box a twist and then align it again and leave it alone. This is backyard beekeeping. Commercial beekeepers are gonna fly through all their stuff and they're just gonna do it. We're back, our beekeepers, we're gonna take our time. So then the next part of that is, you just disrupted a bunch of cells, there is honey dripping down inside. Where's it going? Going to the bottom board. So there's this discussion that we have about screened bottom boards, right? So if you've got screened bottom boards, my preference for you is that you have a tray underneath and that that screen, the area below it, is enclosed. So here's another reason that you want it to be enclosed. If it's an open screen bottom board and you disrupted the honey inside, the bees can't drink it quick enough. Some of it drips down the face of the frames and goes right onto the bottom board. If it's an open screen bottom board, where does it go? Onto the screen and collects there and starts to drip down. If it's doing that, again, you're gonna kick off robbing. All we need is for a couple of scouts from some colony to get a taste of 100% ready to go honey. And what do they do? They get a little of it in their crop and they take off as quick as they can back to their hive and they come back with 50, 60, 100, 1,000, as many bees as are available to come and take advantage of this sudden resource. So the open screen bottom board becomes an attractant. Now, they can't get in, so what are they gonna do after that? They're gonna start putting pressure on the entrance to your hive. They're gonna start attacking the resident bees. They want that sugar. They want that honey. So cover it during the time that you're gonna do this inspection when you're at risk of robbing during a period of dearth, right? Okay, so we did those parts. Now what else can you do? Um, Another thing I like to do is put them on equal ground. You'll hear some beekeepers say that they like to go and they're just gonna pull the cover off every hive in their apiary. They're gonna pull the outer cover, the inner cover. They're gonna put them all on even ground. They're all on the defensive, they're all exposed. I don't like to do that. So I'll tell you right now, I'm never gonna do that. Uh, what I do like to do is I keep little spray bottles of one-to-one -one sugar syrup 
with Honey Bee Healthy in it. So the Honey Bee Healthy extends my sugar syrup all summer long. So I fill these bottles, they're all hanging on a rack, and I just grab them. They're each 32 ounce bottles. And uh, whenever I go out to do an inspection, I can take one with me. So I will spray every landing board and every entrance in the apiary, every one of them. So now they all have the same interests and all their same, they can't go and rob somebody else. Why? Right here at our own entrance, we have sugar syrup spritzed on the front. That puts them on uh, not so much the, you know, the defensive, but we're taking their interests away from the tiny colony that you might be inspecting that can't defend itself. So give that little extra spray and hit every single landing board. And now they don't know what to do. They're going to feed on that. Plus they're not too unhappy that you're out there. So that's another one. Uh, closed screen bottom board. The last one, uh, some people won't want to do this, but you can actually drape your hive. So if you really have to get into that beehive, there's something that you really have to do. We want to do this by the way in the middle of the day. Some people talk about, well, I'll just go out there at night and I'll do my inspections at night. Please don't. And here's why. Uh, when you turn on your lights at night, they'll fly to the light. If you're carrying a flashlight, they'll fly to the flash flashlight. I understand it might be really hot during the day and it just makes more sense to get out there at night to you. But also what's going on inside the hive, every single resident bee, except those that get trapped out at some location overnight while the, it got too dark for them to fly home, um, all the bees are in there. So your, your inspection is hindered by the fact that you have a huge population of bees. You might have a bunch of uh, bearding on the hive, which is what happens this time of year at night. And uh, you've got a bunch of bees up and out of the way, just up and underneath your inner cover. So I highly recommend against doing inspections uh, at night. So you can drape your hive. Now there are bee screen drapes that truckers use that they put over the back when they're transporting hives and things like that to prevent them from flying, of course, while they're driving down the road. But there are very inexpensive mosquito nets that come in all sizes. So I just looked one up before I did today's thing. Um, there are mosquito nets. One is called Meco Pro. So you can Google it if you want to. It's only $17.99 for an 86 by 86 by 70 inch drape. So here's what you can do. You don't want to cover the entrance and the landing board. So you can put your mosquito net across the front. My hives, if you've noticed, they all have T-posts, a lot of them that are sticking up. So uh, you can make a frame if you want to out of PVC pipe and just put it all together so that you have a framework that stands up that you can spread this net over and then clamp it to the front of the hive so the bees are flying in and out of the entrance and then you're behind it. Robber bees in the vicinity won't be able to access the hive that you're opening. You can have another hive stand next to you that you take things off and put them directly on that. We're not putting things on the ground and you're trying to control any spillage that might happen. So those mosquito nets, uh, they have a lot of purposes, by the way, so it wouldn't be just a one-off. You can use that even to drape the area that you're doing your honey extracting. If you're using a garage or some kind of outbuilding and the door's open, uh, you can create an overlapping drape with mosquito netting that keeps bees from accessing where you're doing your uncapping and your spinning and things like that. So that's uh, pretty much all of my recommendations. So once you've twisted the tops and stuff, you go and do that to all the hives that you're going to inspect. You come back and they will have cleaned up those disrupted cells. Now we don't have uh, dripping honey and more important, we don't have exposed honey that passerby foragers and scouts might find and then alert their resident colony to come and attack. So I hope those hints will help you out. And limit your time, have an absolute a job that you want to do, get in, get out fast. Question number three comes from Brad from Chester, New Hampshire. I've always thought when bees swarm, the first queen to emerge from her cell immediately goes around and kills all the other queens while they are still in their queen cells. If the initial queen doesn't make it back from her mating flights, the colony is doomed. For smart bees, I thought this was rather dumb. I'm in the process of rewatching all your past Q&A videos and just now, on video number 70, heard that this is not necessarily true and that the newly emerged queen does not immediately go around and kill all of the queens. Can you discuss the subject again on Friday? Yes, I will. That's what I'm doing right now. So for Brad, um, 
yeah, we often end up with multiple queens in a hive. Uh, so a lot of things happen. And this is what is so frustrating for a lot of new beekeepers. It, you have an answer, a question about something biology related for the bees, and you think, well, there should be absolute answers. It should be pretty clear what they're going to do. So most of the time, that's why I'm careful about the words I use when I describe things. Most of the time. So when they're building queen cells, a swarm is going to happen. It's rare that they build just one or two queen cells. Usually there'll be five, six, seven, or eight or more, depending on the colony and what their situation is. And particularly at times like this, when there's a bunch of resources here in the Northeast. I don't know what's going on where you live. Here in the Northeast, we have a bunch of resources kicking in. So we're going to hit a second threat of swarming. So if we find the queen cells are being built, we know that before they're capped or at the time of their capping, the resident queen flies away with a swarm. And uh, so then the normal, the best case scenario for those bees that are remaining and for the queens that are in development, they're in the pupa state once they're capped. And uh, when they come out, the first one does most often attempt to kill off the other queens that are still in their cells. So the first one that comes out, this is not clear cut because there's a lot of weirdness going on in there. There's favoritism on the part of those nurse bees. Uh, you can tell which of the queen cells they already have a preference for because they do a lot of work on them. They look like the surface of a planter's peanut shell. They're all dimpled. There's a lot of extra beeswax on it. They continue to build and work it and kind of do final touches and they're, they're frequently, their bodies are on it and they do these little tapping and vibrating and they get vibrations back from the queen. So they're checking up on things. Uh, there's a lot of odd stuff that goes on because in some cases, the queen that starts to emerge from her cell is not the one the workers want. So do you know what they're sometimes doing? While well, she's trying to chew out of her queen cell and they're vertical, by the way, so they're pointing down. When she's trying to chew out, there'll be wax worker bees right there restoring the wax that she's chewing out. Or she tries to chew around and flip off the cap of her queen cell and there'll be workers physically holding that shut. So that's very interesting behavior. What they're doing is they're buying time while another queen that they do like gets out of her cell and then she goes around and the queen can actually chew into the side of a queen cell and sting the resident pupae or the one that's about to emerge there right under the wing. So they're very accurate with their stingers and that's their goal in a perfect scenario. The dominant, healthiest, strongest, most vibrant, first emerging queen goes around and stings and kills all those that would compete for their role in that hive, right? But then what happens is sometimes we get what's known as after swarms. And after swarms are curious and this is how we know there are often multiple queens because there will be swarms that emerge from a hive that has already recently swarmed. So it's very frustrating for the beekeeper. Why they do it, we don't always know. So there's an after swarm. So that colony just swarmed and three days later, they're swarming again and it's a good sized swarm. And then it gets frustrating because you think, aha, I got them, I collected them. Now I'm gonna dump them in this hive and look, half of them came out of the hive and won't go in but half of them are in. What is the problem with the swarm? Well, if you sort through them, you can find out there's two queens in that swarm. The ones that are clustered on the outside that won't go in that seem to just get into a tighter and tighter cluster out there. Well, the others are already setting up chop, coming and going. You've got another queen. You've got another swarm in this after swarm, and it's highly likely she never completed a mating flight. So now you have to take that one and put that in some little nuke or something like that. The other option you have is sort through, find the queen, remove her, and then they'll either join the others right there because they go after whatever queen pheromone is closest, or they'll go home to the colony that they came from. The other part is, um, aside from that scenario, you get queens that emerge at the same time and they're referred to as sister queens. And uh, they kind of put up with each other. They fail to fight. They fail to have a conflict. So then you end up with a colony that has kind of one primary queen. It's very rare that I've seen two queens in the same colony and both of them are like equal in size. 
and both of them are highly productive, usually you get one that's a little bit suppressed and not well fed by the nurse bees. But she's tolerated. They're not killing her. They're not putting her out. But you've got one that definitely made a mating flight, came back, and is laying and is productive. And so you kind of have this weird queen in reserve still walking around in there. So this is not the most common thing that happens. This is just the potential thing that can happen. And that's why it you know, frequently happens. You find multiple queens in a swarm. A lot of reasons for that. And uh, you can find more than one queen in the same hive, particularly in these very large hives. If you're doing an inspection and you find very distinct brood areas that are well separated from each other, it doesn't make sense logistically inside the hive that you would have brood after your middle super and brood down in what we call the brood box, which is usually the one right on the landing board. So there's honey in between them and then there's like another brood area. What, what's that about? Uh, which can occur when you don't have queen excluders, which I don't use. So uh, then you'll find out there's eggs up there. There's eggs down here. You've got two functioning uh, colonies. And in really large hives, that can happen. You can have two laying productive queens, basically communal living, two colonies living together in the same hive. But you'll see some weirdness as far as the brood goes. You see like a break in it. This also happens in horizontal hives. You'll see a bunch of brood, then you'll see some bee bread, and then there'll be resources of nectar and everything. But then a, another kind of resurgence of brood showing up as you're going through the frames. And so there's another brood cluster here. Now, often when you find the second brood cluster, it's nothing but drones. That does not indicate another queen. But if you have distinctive worker brood patterns divided by honey resources, I start looking for another queen. And uh, so then you have a two queen colony. What should you do? Nothing. Just leave them there. But uh, so there are a lot of variables for Brad and anybody else who's listening. I know this is hard for new beekeepers because we want absolute answers. And that is part of the fun of the bees. Different colonies can behave differently. They've all got their personalities. Queens tend to do things a little differently and they've got their behaviors. There are some standards, there are some rules, uh, but uh, when it comes to queens, you can have more than one and they don't always kill off the others. Question number four comes from Mark from Salem, Virginia. Hi Fred, I've been using your method of using the insulation under the outer cover and no upper vent year round. I have a ton of uncapped honey in my hives this year and with the heat and humidity, these last few weeks, I suspect the bees are having a difficult time dehydrating the nectar into capable honey. Is this a time when adding temporary ventilation will help them to dehydrate all the uncapped honey and make this into extractable goodness? I don't have a decent room in my house to put these supers in and add a dehumidifier. Any other suggestions? Yes, I have suggestions. Okay, so we want to add ventilation, but we want to maintain protection for the hive in the form of a small entrance. We don't want them to have to constantly patrol their landing board. These are, this is a stainless steel screen. This is pretty stout stuff. You can also use aluminum window screen, but I like these now. Now, some people have noticed that this edge here is fairly, has these little clipped ends, so they're fairly sharp, and they think that the bees are injuring themselves when they go. So you could fold this over and bend it and create a rounded deal, so you would bend it twice. So fold this unfinished edge in once, fold it over again, then we have no sharp edges left. You could do that. Um, you can also take a piece like this, put it over the entrance, cut the entrance out, and remove your entrance reducer. So these come in sheets. Here's a bigger one, nice and stiff, and you would get several out of this. So they would be the width of your landing board. And then you just cut the hole to match um, what you want your entrance reduction to be. So it can be three eighths, it can be two or three inches wide. And then you leave these parts to cover the rest of the entrance that normally would be blocked by a wooden entrance reducer. So we pull the entrance reducer out, we put the screen in place, and we have a cutout, fold out, however you wanna do it, 
so that your bees can come and go. But now they've got a broad venting area and uh, it's not an area that they have to defend. And if they don't want that there, you'll see them start to purpleize it. But remember, this is something that you're only doing at a time when the robbing is high risk and when they have a lot of nectar to dehydrate. So that does help them. I personally do not like to, even now when you know, the nectar is really coming in, I don't like to put on an upper entrance and I don't like to put on top venting. The reason for that is uh, you can tell when you're, you're, you know, your beehive is being cased by robbers. They are the bees that are flying around the back of your hive. They're checking all the joints. They are flying. If you've got nickels shimming your inner cover and things like that, and your bees are venting, you know that you're smelling the honey through there. So in my thinking, I want one area that the honey scent is coming from, and that's the entrance area because that's where your guard bees are concentrated. So I don't like to encourage other bees to come and snoop around the back areas of the hive. They can't get in up there, but uh, keep in mind too, like here where I live, sure, it might get to be 80 degrees today, and uh, you open up that top and you've got some venting going out of there. But at night, what are they doing? At night when it cools down, because the dew point also gets achieved all over. That's why there's a heavy dew on everything. I believe the dew point right now is in the 60s. And so when things cool down, surfaces cool down, there's condensation forming on everything. Um, I like all the venting to happen out the front. If your warm air is leaving through the top, now your bees, even in summertime, when it cools down at night, they're heating the brood. So remember, all the other things are going on in the hive as well. So just dehydrating the honey, which by the way, they're very good at that. They spread it around to a lot more cells than they need. And hopefully you've provided them with the surface area that they need to do that. And then they're consolidating it at night. So they're moving it around. Um, and they fan everything. So they keep the air moving. And I even put a hot wire anemometer down in front of the hive and found that they were moving air out of there at five to six miles per hour, that that's the fan speed. So that was pretty interesting to me. And so if you use rolled aluminum or if you use straight sheets of aluminum like this, the rolled aluminum, they were moving air right through that. So there must have been bees inside moving the air out that I didn't see. Often you'll see bees outside on the landing board facing the entrance and fanning air away from the hive. And it's very interesting how air is moved efficiently through the hive. If the bees stood right in the entrance, let's uh, pretend that it's a house with a window. If you put a fan in the window, like one of those box fans or something, and you turn that on and that moves air out of your house, right? Do you know that that is less efficient than if that same fan were put inside the house a foot away from the window? So here's your open window. This is the home interior. You had your fan in the window. Seems like the right thing to do. Get it out of the window, put it a foot in, and then turn it on and see how much air is passing through that house. How do we know that? Because you open another window that you're measuring the amount of air being drawn into the house while air is being blown out of the house through that window. And there was an increase of air pulling in and going out when the fan was pulled out of the window and set to the interior of the house. Bees are wicked efficient at moving air. That's why inside the hive, they're inside away from the entrance, not always right on the entrance. And then you'll find that there's a whole train of bees inside there that are lined up with one another and they're passing air over their backs to the bee behind them. And if they detect warmer or more humid air to the left or to the right of what their position is, that bee that's in line moving the air moves over into the hotter, warmer air path, and then so do the others. They align themselves. So wherever the dehydration needs to occur, the bees are going to cycle air through the hive in a very efficient way. Not just that. Throughout the year, they've been building burr comb and brace comb and things like that that also are aligned for them to move air through the hive based on the entrance configuration that you started the year with. So it is really interesting, and I still say, venting through the top, even during times like this when you're trying to dehydrate the honey, um, 
is not as efficient as just opening up the landing board a little more and maybe putting a screen in there if you want to. So um, I've left them all different ways because remember if you do every change at once, you don't have comparisons, you don't know if one was more effective than the other. So even the colonies that I have that are pretty darn big right now that have a small entrance are doing just as well as those next to them like I have right now, a uh, full-size um, flow hive that is a three eighths inch entrance, but it's open all the way across. Uh, they're on par with the hive right next to it that has a smaller entrance. So, and no top venting for any of them. Okay, I hope that helps. Experiment and see what's going on. See what you do. But remember, when it cools down at night, they're going to be warm in the hive. Question number five. Okay, this is the funny one because this has to do with the thumbnail today. And uh, I thought it was weird that I had never heard of this thing. So this is from James Barron. Remove the bug sting and welt using bug bite thing. It's perfect. And I went on to say that and I guess I was truncated. But it says remove the bug sting welt and use bug bite thing. It's perfect for gardeners. Okay. So I, never, I thought this looks like a gimmick. You know, bug bite thing. That's what it is. And uh, when I was a kid, I was a snake collector, like most little kids are, I'm sure. And I always liked to have my snake bite kit with me. In fourth grade, when I lived in Flagstaff, Arizona, I collected my first rattlesnake. Because I thought I knew everything about snakes back then. And my kit had little suction cups in it. But we learned later, and it even had a scalpel and other stuff, which was kind of hokey for this little kit. And this was, you know, what's that, in the 70s? Anyway, 69 or 70. Anyway, um, I was told much later, you don't know, use a scalpel and cut fang marks and then suck out the venom because the venom is already in your superhighway because you've been injected with a rattlesnake hemotoxin, by the way, the Sidewinders had. But what we're talking about is this thing. James told me to look this up and I thought it was hokey and he even has a website on it, bugbitething.com. All this is, is if you got stung by a mosquito, stung by a bee, and they have pictures on here of bees and wasps and everything else on there. And uh, it also has two different tips on it. So you've got this narrow tip, so mosquito bite, and you're supposed to put this on your mosquito bite and you pull this halfway up or whatever, and then it sucks the venom out. And there's instructions with it that tell you to do that five to 10 seconds to start and so on. So anyway, and if you had a bigger sting or something, the cap flips and it's a bigger part. And then the same thing, you put that on the sting and you draw this up and then it sticks and creates a vacuum, blah, blah, blah. So does that work on bee stings? I don't know if a lot of beekeepers are gonna do that, but here's what I know about little kids. If you have a seven-year-old, let's say, junior beekeeper, and uh, my niece was out here, she was stung three times on her foot. This might work. According to, by the way, how many reviews do you think are on this thing on Amazon, which I checked into today? 88,000 reviews on this bug bite thing. So I thought 88,000 people bought these and reviewed it. That's interesting. But when it comes to little kids, you know what they like half of this is the attention you give them. So if they got stung on the foot, stung on the leg, something like that. And uh, if you break out one of these and you tell them, this is going to take all the venom out of that bite spot. And we're going to make sure that uh, you see that. Oh, look, we just sucked all the venom out for you. And now that's that's going to work. But here's the thing. Now I'm being a little bit jokey about that. I'm kind of making fun of it a little bit. But not according to the people that uh, have left their responses on Amazon. This thing, supposedly, and these are people that have been stung before or been stung by mosquitoes and things like that. And... Uh, they find that they get much faster relief. So adults would hold this on there for 10 to 20 seconds, and then you remove it. You could, uh, if you're not careful, it could look like you have a bunch of hickeys all over. I don't know if they even talk about that anymore. 
But uh, so I bought a couple of them. And so you can bet the next time the grandkids are stung or something, I can uh, do this and then we can draw some of that venom out and see if it doesn't work. Now, those of you who have intermediate reactions, you get stung on the wrist or the forearm or somewhere where I wish we had this because last week we did that video where we brought in an, a retired soldier and his wife happens to be a physician's assistant and uh, we had him get stung on the forearm and then she took his vitals and everything and we wanted to see uh, how he reacted and what the pain was and the bottom line was that he did have an elevated blood pressure but as far as that there was nothing really significant it wasn't as exciting as you thought it might have been but it would have been interesting if we had one of these and uh, but then we would have to compare it to what his normal response is and see if by sucking the venom out if this would add to it if you have used one of these before put that down in the comment section i guess james must have used it he knows all about it and uh, bought a couple of them even ants so if you've got maybe those fire ants down in south carolina i don't like those and I'm sure they're in other states besides South Carolina. That's where I met the fire ants when I was in the swamps. And I had a flat tire and I was changing my tire. And next thing you know, I was covered in these little ants that all started biting at the same time. So if it works and you've got experience with this, um, let me know in the comment section. And uh, if you want to try one out, they're only $9. Well, it's $9 for probably a two dollar piece of plastic but if it works it's probably worth it so let me know what you think have you tried it have you seen them have you used it Eighty-eight thousand people did so i want to thank james for bringing that to my attention because it is curious it's funny i am going to keep one in my bee kit and stuff and particularly when kids are here and things if they get stung i'll try it out on them you know if you get stung on the finger which is what happens to me most often I'm grabbing a frame and picking it up like this and there'll be the one bee behind it that I didn't see and get it right on the ear of the frame and it stings me on the finger and then my hand swells up and make sure you don't have your rings on. And if you missed that video showing David getting stung by the bee, you get a close up of the stinger and you see its little muscle pulsing away and the stinger is embedding itself in his arm. So there is some interesting information there. So I hope you check that out. So we're moving on to question number six. Um, the name here is the great S the great STM eight. So that's the YouTube channel. It says on the Epime hives, uh, five over five using dividers. Will this hive allow a flow super on top or is it still a finagle to fit? Just thinking the bees will fill it faster so if you've got the five over five so there's a 10 frame apame brood box got a divider in the middle five on each side and then another super on that five on each side could we put a flow super up there and get the bees to fill it up and i wrote back i hadn't tried it yet and i don't like it and here's why so i did take a flow super out there and i did try to set it on the apame hive uh, the problem is the way the apame hive is configured uh, there's a shoulder that the next apame box would sit on so they sit down on top of each other like this when you take a flow super out there it sits right on top of that little ridge so you've got the insulator part comes in and there's a ridge that goes up your next box if it's a standard langstroth box or something like that it sits on there so now we have to strap it down and it's pretty slippery because it's just plastic so you can put it on but it's not a, a good secure connection until your bees uh, propolize it up hoping that they would you can try it the other thing i notice is it creates quite a gap so there's more than bee space above the frames of the next box below for those of you who don't know what bee space is it's three eighths of an inch so when you get bigger than three eighths of an inch the bees tend to build comb up in there if it's lower than three eighths of an inch the bees can then propolize it like they would a seam or a joint so it'll sit on there, but you're gonna to have to find some way to secure it so it doesn't slip around. And uh, I'm not, not excited about doing that. But uh, it, it's an interesting question, but it was not compatible. And I also took a standard Langstroth um, 
medium super because we did super some Apame boxes and I was, I'm all out of the Apame gear. A box from Apame just arrived this morning, but I think that's uh, feeders for the new hives. So I'm looking forward to doing that. But uh, I don't have any more Apame bodies. So we did put the supers on there. And as I just described, I'm counting on the bees to glue it up. And these are definitely supers that we're pulling off to harvest honey. They will not be on in that configuration for winter time. So I think it's it's okay, but for the Flow Super, I would not recommend it. Um, but it sounds like a good idea because you would have a whole bunch of bees. You could try it, but you're gonna have to find a way to rig it to keep it aligned. So question number seven comes from Vicky from Rhineback, New York. How do you deal with a semi-full, semi-capped Flow Frame Super when reducing hives for winter? Well, my answer to that is not just for the flow frame, but any any um, honey supers that I have to get off for winter. So it comes, I mean, because you start looking at the forecast, we get late September, early October, and we can still get some really good weather in October, and we can get uh, some pretty good nectar and pollen coming in in October as well. So the problem for me is, I finish up all of my surplus honey extracting in September. Then for that last week of September, first week of October, they're pretty much guaranteed that they can collect their own resources during that time frame, and that's what I want them to do. Um, and that's also when I start packing them down. So I'll describe that process a little bit. Uh, when I'm packing down these hives, um, we need to get the bees out of those upper boxes too. So I use bee escapes, and my favorite bee escapes are the um, Cirocell style. Darn, I don't have my Cirocell bee escapes down here. I took them all because I had to go and give a presentation. So, um, but I use bee escapes, get them out of there, and then I pull everything uh, because we can run out of time and we can end up with uh, winter conditions all of a sudden here. So once I pull those supers off, then I have capped, uncapped. We might get full frames of honey that are uncapped. So these are the choices that you have. Uh, also, because we're wrapping up the year, we're trying to fortify the colonies. And if it's not a capped frame, that can go through the extractor and has a proper um, you know, dehydration level. So if it's not 18% water or less, it would need some dehydration. So 20% or less, I might put it in with my dehumidifier and fans inside something called the Vivo Sun Grow Tent. So the Vivo Sun Grow Tent is something that I can put in. It also doubles as my, my hot room. If people are doing commercial beekeeping, they have what's known as a hot room, which is where they wheel in all of their hundreds of supers of honey. And uh, they've got dehumidifiers in there. They've got fans blowing. And they're probably bringing that whole room up to about 90 degrees. For the backyard beekeeper, that's not very practical. So I bring mine in, I have this little rolling cart and I put uh, the supers that have open honey on them. If I'm gonna keep them, I put the supers that, that are they're pretty full, so they're worth the effort. And uh, I just dehydrate them in my Vivo Sun tent. So you can look those up. The biggest one that they have is 96 inches. That's the length of it by 48 inches wide and it's 78 inches tall. So you can wheel a cart right in there. I have fans, they have a metal frame so the fans clip on the top and they're blowing directly on it. And then that serves as my hot room because I found out that by putting my dehumidifier in there, uh, it just runs the fan. It doesn't always run the dehumidifier, which by the way, uses a lot of power, but just running the fans in there, it heats up the space to what? 91 degrees. So I put temp and humidity sensors in there that read out. So I will always know, I check it with my phone and I will always know exactly what the temp and humidity is down inside of that. So, uh, and when I say I check it on my phone, it's the Ambient Weather Network. So the AW, it's the same company that built my weather station that's outside. They sell additional sensors that are temp and humidity and so on. So that's what's inside my Vivo Sun. I know what's going on. And uh, that has been interesting because not only does it reduce that moisture content. So let's say I put something in there that was 21% water. Uh, it averages about a percent and a half every 24 hours. 
And that's without doing anything. It's just sitting in there. So I didn't uncap. I didn't do anything. So then I found out what that actually can do too is if you've got some cells in that uh, honey super that have begun to crystallize a little bit, by holding it at that temperature for several days, it actually reliquifies those cells. So then we go from that to uncapping to extracting. Now, let's say you don't want to do that. Uh, which, by the way, those tents, if you look them up on your own, they're $134.99, which is not bad. They're inside. They'll last forever. You can set them right up in your garage or something because you don't want to heat your whole garage. You don't want to blow fans in your whole garage. And you want to keep flies and things out of your honey. So the other part of that is we're at the end of the year. We're trying to bolster some of these colonies. And also what happens when the nectar flow draws to a close where you live You've got all of these foraging bees. That is the most critical potential for robbing. So that time of year is when you get a warm day and a cold day and a warm day and a cold day. As soon as you get these warm days, they are putting pressure on every colony out there and they are fever pitched. They're desperate for it. It's worse than the bees going out here and chasing off the Orioles from the Oriole feeders. They are just gonna mob any nectar source. They'll kill each other over it. So I like to set up a feeding station far away from my apiary. And by far away, I'm talking 150 yards. So I'll, I have a feeding station that's established and I'll take all those frames because I'm also lazy. And if I'm just going to put them in storage, why not just let the bees do double duty for me? They're going to feed themselves because they're gonna clean up the frames and they are also um, gonna fortify the colonies that they've come from. And because the days are getting cooler, I don't have to worry about these foragers coming from other apiaries a mile away or more. So I can put that feeding station out there. They'll get the resources that they need. They'll take the honey that's a little bit too wet for us. And uh, they'll also clean up the frames and uh, then we can put them in storage for winter and then have them in springtime. So those are kind of uh, the two ways that I handle that. So, and then I'm packing down for winter time and then they're all in storage and by storage, I mean, these boxes are stacked with frames in them. Um, I turn them 90 degrees to one another. So they're just like, you know, teeing over each other. You can drape them. Uh, that would probably be a good use for that. Uh, I mentioned, I just thought of this now, but I mentioned earlier about this mosquito netting stuff that I just looked up today. Um, I can see that being draped over your boxes that are in storage and uh, wax moss can't get in there to lay any eggs. So look at that. You might have some other options there. So that's pretty much it for that. How do I break them down? That's what I would do. And that's not just flow supers, it's any super. I do that for all of them. Question number eight uh, comes from Joby. And it says, I was wondering if you'd be able to talk about diagnosing the state of a hive using all the various different things that fall onto the bottom board. I think we can learn a lot from this. For example, mite drop, emerging drones, uncapping honey, evidence of robbing, building new comb, discarded, dried up larvae and pollen, waxworms and ants, and so on. This is why I really, it's another reason that I really like screened bottom boards. Fred, why don't you have screen, screen bottom boards all over your apiary? Because I haven't caught up yet. Half of my hives have screen bottom boards. Even my observation hives have screen bottom boards. And they have inserts or trays underneath or they're enclosed. And it is a lot of fun uh, to pull those out. And I already wrote back to Jovi, I think that I pull these trays out and we put them on tables and it's a great teaching tool. So when you have a, it doesn't matter what age, 10 year olds to 20 year olds to whatever, if they're, if they're learning about bees and what goes on in the hive, we get a lot of information out of these trays. Now, if you don't put Pam cooking spray or something like that on the surface of the tray, why would I do that? When you put on Pam cooking spray, about 15, now this is according to uh, Dr. Thomas Seeley. You passively control roughly 15% of the varroa destructor mites simply by having a screen bottom board. 
So in other words, 15% of those mites are eventually going to misstep or they're going to get groomed off of a bee. They're going to fall through the screen and uh, they're going to be in that tray. Now, if there's no cooking spray or something on the surface down there, uh, they can walk out and eventually find their way back to the bees and get back on the body of a bee and reinfest. So if they fall in there, they get stuck. And here's the other thing too, if you don't have cooking spray or something that creates a sticky surface in there for them, you can also use mineral oil. Uh, there are little bugs and stuff that get into your trays underneath the hive that will steal the varroa mites away. They feed on their dying and dead bodies. So they'll drag them away and you wouldn't necessarily know that you had them. So that's why it's important to enclose it and also to have some kind of surface that holds them there. And you're also going to see that they're bringing in pollen. And that's why you do routine tray cleanings. Now, I have two or three trays for every hive that needs one. And the reason I do that is because I can pull a tray out. I've got a new one with me. I put the clean one right in, take the other one away, and I document with uh, dry erase markers. So that same kind you would use on a dry erase board and I mark the hive number that it came from. And then we stack them all up, take them into the, the B building and we put them on a table and look them over with magnifying glasses and stuff. So that's how we know, uh, we see like, oh, there's eight mites on this one. What hive did that come from? Oh, there's two mites on this one. Oh, there's no mites on this one. So uh, by having them there for a couple of weeks, we can get a feel for mite drop. That, uh, and that's a tiny representation. It doesn't necessarily replace counting mites, but if I had an insert tray underneath the hive that was clean and I sprayed it with Pam cooking spray or something, and this also includes a core flute insert, if you spray that with some sticky stuff, uh, you pull that out and you got eight or nine Varroa destructor mites on the surface of that after just two weeks treating that colony. I don't have to count them. I know they've got enough that they're actually falling off the bees. So that's a treatment hive. On others, like in my observation hives right now, I had one mite from one hive. So my mite counts are still low, and that's a hypothetical, by the way. I've not had eight mites on a bottom board of any of my hives this year. So we're still going strong with just the integrated pest management and no treatment on all but one colony. One colony was treated with oxalic acid vaporization and uh, it had a mite load. So, um, and you're right, you'll see bits and pieces, you'll see feet from bees and stuff like that, pollen that falls off of the bees because they're moving across the screen and it just gets away from them. And by the way, if pollen falls off of bees, let's say it was a solid landing board and let's say you're looking at trays and screens and thinking, well, if the pollen fell through the screen, if they had a solid bottom board, wouldn't the pollen then still be on the bottom board and now the bees could gather that up and use it? No, because here's what I found out with the bees when, if they're going through something or they brush against each other or they're tussling around in the hive and if the pollen falls off of their hind legs, bees will lick it. And do you know why? Because it's got some nectar on it. So it tastes sweet. They're not going to gather it recollect it, put it into a cell, and turn it into bee bread. Once it, they have, you know, we have that five second rule where something drops on the kitchen floor and next thing you know, you're eating it before the dog can. Well, in the hive, there is no five second rule. Something falls off the bee and it's on the bottom board, it's discarded. It's not suitable anymore to be fed to baby bees. So it's not brood food. So that's interesting too. And uh, so the other thing that's fun is what kind of critters are cruising around under there. There was a mention here of uh, the wax moths, uh, wax worms. And we think of wax worms as being pretty big and they've chewed the wood and things like that in a hive that was ignored or neglected or whatever. Because for me, the only time I've ever had wax worms is when I had stored equipment closed off somewhere ignored for an extended period of time. I've never had that in an occupied colony of bees. But uh, the waxworms are actually very tiny. And when they're first cruising around, and again, thanks to observation hives, that's how I noticed it. There was wax up against the glass and we had cells. So this was just the, the thickness of the wax between the wax cells, the honeycomb. 
and I could see the tiny wax worms moving through that. Now they're inside the wall of the beeswax. How long will that wax worm survive? Not very, because as they get bigger, they will no longer fit in those walls. And the minute they're big enough, the bees sense them, chew them out, and they're done. So occupy colonies don't get overrun with wax worms. But it is interesting. It's a great teaching tool. You also get to point out uh, a lot of people will look at little little brown bits of propolis and they'll go, aha, varroa destructor mite. But then under magnification, you realize oh, it's just propolis. So it is teaching you what kind of detritus is down there and uh, what's in the hive. And you see chewed cappings from wax from uh, the cells and things like that. So it's all interesting. Good to know. Much better probably to make a video about that someday and uh, pull the tray out and then look closely and let's get in there and macro everything that's on that tray and talk about what we find. I think I want to thank you for that inspiration because that sounds like something that we should do. So question number nine. Uh, this comes from Calypso for me. That's the YouTube channel name. This was fantastic for us and your grandson. So this is the video that my seven-year-old grandson, Quinn, and I, uh, we went out and collected a swarm and we used a big fishing net, like a sea-going fishing net. We lined it with cotton cloth and that's a double size, extra large pillowcase, you know, 250 count, you know, Egyptian cotton, whatever it was, dirt sheep on Amazon. Anyway, if you had caught the queen and forced them all into one of those two hives that they rejected, they would have probably swarmed out relatively quickly. I agree that the first choice you offered appeared too small. So we tried to get them. I let Quinn make these decisions. It's how he learns. And uh, so we had a five frame nucleus hive, which was by uh, Beesver, Bearsville Bees. And uh, they weren't even, you know, they explored it they inspected it, it was rejected. The queen would not go in. So we took away the five frame because we're dealing with a large swarm. So we put a 10 frame brood box, bottom board, some frames with drawn comb, some frames just foundation. They did the same thing. They walked in, they walked it off, uh, they licked it over and the queen made appearances over and over. So this is a video, a link the video to question number nine. So you can see it if you're interested. And what happened was the queen wouldn't go in. So if the queen doesn't accept the space that your bees are inspecting, uh, they won't stay. So instead they stayed clustered on the outside. I set up a time-lapse camera because I was sure I was going to get those bees eventually changing their mind and going in. I used Swarm Commander ever so lightly in the back in the top so they would approve of it. Didn't work. What they did is they flew away, thought we lost them, but as they flew away, they flew over my apiary and they landed on the very last hive in my apiary, which just happened to be occupied, but queenless. So it was a hive. I was already kind of in a decision-making process about what am I going to do with them? Do I really want to requeen them this time of year? They're kind of in a weird location. Uh, they moved into a hive that was occupied but queenless. So their scouts found a place where the guards did not defend it. They let them all move in. So I went from having a hive that's in profound decline. And instead of that, it's one of the most productive hives. In fact, it's the one that's got the, uh, the wooden medium super on it. We just supered it uh, on top of the Apame boxes. So, and the other part of this question, which is interesting to me now was, I wonder what was wrong about your second choice? Was the entrance of the chosen hive facing the same direction as the ones they rejected? So many questions. Okay, so that's actually a good question because um, the nucleus hive that I was using and of course the 10 frame brood box that I put up there, they were facing south by southeast which is my number one choice for orienting all of my hives. But because I like to make comparisons, I also have hives that face north and east and northeast and so on. So you're absolutely right 
the hive they moved into was facing northwest and was right next to a spruce tree. So I don't know what's going on, but I do think uh, the predominant reason that they moved into that hive is because their scouts had checked it out. Um, for all I know, some of the foragers from that hive, because remember, they're not faithful to their queen. Also remember, that colony is queenless. So they've got scouts out foraging and foragers foraging. So scouts and foragers are actually different. Scouts find resources, find places to go, things like that. And then they inform foragers that go out and get the resources. So I think there's a chance that scouts that were in that swarm were from that queenless colony. Now, they were not the hive that the swarm came out of, because we know which hive that happened from. And uh, so there are scouts going back and forth, communicating with this cluster that's on the front of the hive, and they all fly away, and they go right into that hive. So that's what I suspect happened. And it's because we can put a queen mandibular pheromone, we just had this discussion, discussion recently, um, when the pheromone is by itself just zipped onto a tree branch, and that's not the purpose of it, but it's what we do because we're playing with the bees, uh, you get a bunch of bees clustered onto that, and it looks like a little swarm of bees. There is no queen. So we know that they will go to colonies that have queens. Also, scouts or foragers that are out and about will reroute themselves and just join up with a cluster that has a queen. I don't know why they do it, they obviously have a place to live, they have a place to go, they change their mind, and they create a swarm where one did not exist before. In other words, you could, in theory, I'm not telling you to do this, but it's on my experiment list, get a mated queen, mail order, whatever, in the little queen cage, right? And then you take your little queen in your queen cage like this. This one has an aluminum piece on it. You would put this on the tree branch and that holds her in place and do this between 11 in the morning and two in the afternoon. And on that tree branch, you would find eventually a couple of scout bees would come by and they'll collect on this cage. They don't know that queen, but she has a mated queen's pheromone. Eventually you'll get 50, 60, 100, 200, 300, before you know it, you've got a micro swarm around a queen that they didn't know because this is even better than the queen mandibular pheromone noodle that we're zipping on there because that will get sometimes a pound or more of bees and there's no queen in there. How much better if we had a queen in there and then they collect all around her on that branch. Now we have what we need to start a nucleus colony. So that's what I suspect happened with the other hive that was queenless. I think their scouts and foragers are both joined up with that swarm when they were on the branch. They ended up in front of a hive. They rejected the hive and they lobbied through their waggle dances to get the rest of those bees to go to another cavity they happen to know about, which is their queenless colony, their cavity that they're already living in. And off they went and established themselves. And that's fine with me. So it was very interesting. And I think if you want to see that video, please look at it. The link will be down in question number nine. And that's an interesting question too. Thank you for that. Question number 10 comes from Jane from Mondovi, Wisconsin. I hope I said that right. It says, bought two nukes installed in May. Bees are doing great. Question, the frames that came with a nuke were well used and need to be replaced in the near future. Always full of brood. How do I replace and with what? I have new frames or honey frames I've extracted honey from. Thanks for your help. So while they have brood in it, um, my rotation, let's just talk about that a little bit. My rotation of uh, brood comb, which is the most concentrated and dirtiest comb, it gets the darkest. In fact, it can almost look black over time. 
And uh, it's constantly getting thickened and toughened up because it's fibrous, because bees make cocoons in it. So um, every five years, I want to rotate that comb out. So then as you get to spring, for example, so if you've got this nucleus colony, they're occupying the brood frames, we're going to put another uh, new contact. If, if these are wooden new hives, this is what I like to do. So we'll put another one on top of it as they fill those frames. And it sounds like they're already full because this was a purchased nuke and they're full. Um, super it up. And they'll move up. They'll build and store resources up there. And as you come out of winter, they'll be in that upper box. I don't rotate my lower boxes, top and bottom like that. Uh, that's your opportunity then to pull frames out of the bottom because there's not brood in them. And then we can take those top frames and just shift them right down and then put your new frames above them. So in spring is the perfect time. And that's why nuke hives, this is really easy to do. And the reason is uh, all my nukes are deep frames. So the pickle kind of comes in when you've got medium boxes that are up above and you've got deeps in your new hive, but that's not the end of the world either. Uh, and I also like to do this as a teaching tool too, because it is fun. You can pull, again, they'll migrate up in the winter time into the upper box, whether it's a nuke or otherwise. And you wanna rotate out your oldest and dirtiest brood frames. So when you pull a frame out, again, you can take one of the frames from up above and drop it down, but it's a medium frame, now what? Well, they're gonna pull and draw a comb on the bottom of that. Nine times out of 10, the comb that they draw out on the bottom of that medium frame is going to be a drone comb. So, but it also, it gets them out of the upper box, lets you throw away the other stuff. But that's why when it comes to the nukes, I highly recommend that all your nukes be deeps. Some people are doing all mediums on all their hives. I personally don't wanna do that. But, uh, and the reason is though, because they don't wanna interchange frame sizes. So they don't wanna be dealing with mediums and then they have to be dealing with deeps and they come out to do a medium and it's a deep and so on. Um, I see nothing wrong with that. So you just swap out the frames as they age. So if you didn't wanna drop them down while they're up, you pull the oldest, dirtiest comb and you put in your nice fresh new stuff right in the center. And then you're just cycling your oldest comb, your oldest frames to the out board positions. So I like to replace 20% a year. So that's two frames out of 10. And you move the old, the newer frames to the middle, older frames to the outside. And as they build up and so on, you can, you can just cycle those out. But so there's a couple of ways that uh, you can do it. So there you go. Very easy. Now we're in the fluff because that was question number 10. And you're in the, if you're in the Northeastern United States this weekend, it's going to be 80s and 70s, 70s tomorrow, 80s after that. Storms are forecast for Monday. So this is your time to do lots of work, clean things up around your hives. So anyway, uh, consider rolled aluminum screens on your entrances. Since we talked about the venting and we have this big nectar flow on, you can use these, you can take aluminum screen, it's easy to cut, you roll it up and you just tuck them in, just, just pressure fit them in there, leave your entrance where it currently is, you pull your wooden entrance reducer out, screens allow more venting, but still your colony is protected from being robbed because the robbers come in at the edges. And the wasps are making themselves known and those little jerks. Here's what's happened. The wasp nests are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Of course, they've been doing that all through the year. Um, as they get near the end of the year, here's the reward that wasps and hornets, by the way, I've seen the um, bald face hornets, that's just a name. They're really just a wasp. They're not a hornet at all. It's just bald face hornets are black and yellow, pale yellow to the point where they look black and white. Uh, and then the other thing is European hornets, right? So what they're doing is they're hunting things up and uh, they're killing bees and other insects. And they're doing a lot of good too because they're nabbing caterpillars and stuff like that. Tent caterpillars don't even get to build a tent on my property. So then what happens is, as you get to the end of the year, they're, they're bringing in this meat protein because the wasp itself can't eat the meat protein. So what it does, it brings it back, feeds its larvae, which has this ravenous appetite for meat protein. The larvae pays back the wasp that fed them 
with, it's like honeydew. So they excrete this sweet liquid. It's like, thank you for feeding me. This is your reward. Now, as these nests get really big and they start to decline, so their brood areas are getting smaller. And then what happens then is they're not getting the nectar fix that they needed. So now they have more numbers. They can send out more wasps, more hornets, and they're hunting for the nectar. And this is why they will rob a colony of bees too. And they have this weird advantage. They can fly in colder temperatures. So in the mornings when your colonies are still clustered inside, anytime the temperatures are below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, your bees are actually forming a loose cluster inside the hive. When they do that, and just as I mentioned before, we've had mornings in the 40s, wasps get right in unchecked. So then if they access honey stores and get out, they come back in force, they come back in numbers. So you end up with all these numbers. So those that keep hive gate units or they have these long entrances, uh, those colonies are much better at defending themselves from these wasps. So at this time of year, they're not so much after the bees themselves, they're after the nectar that they're no longer getting at home. So that's gonna ramp up as the year continues and as winter comes along. So also another reason why don't open up those entrances wide. You can increase venting, but leave them with a protected fence across the front in the form of these stainless steel screens. You get these at any hardware store, Menards, Home Depot, get the really thick stuff. It lasts forever. Um, so that's the next one. The other one is, you know, pay attention to your colonies. This could be another chance as the, the fall nectar flow kicks in that they could swarm on you. So we want to stay ahead of that. So if you're a backyard beekeeper, you don't want to put more supers on, or maybe you don't even have more supers to put on. Maybe you don't have the boxes. What you can do is something that I mentioned before, you get your hive butler tote out there or some other tote, pull every other frame of capped beeswax that's in the top, capped honey, and uh, put that in your box and then put drawn comb right back in there and let them continue to fill it. So they get this sense that there's more space to fill all the time. And by not letting them fill a box wall to wall, frame to frame, by keeping little spaces that still need to be filled, it's called checkerboarding, um, they stay stimulated to gather and store resources. Because you're also going to find as the year goes on that uh, there'll be thousands of bees inside the hive with nothing to do. They're just parked. So we want to keep them employed and we don't want to give them kind of a break this time of year. Because what do they do too when they have nothing else to do? They get into mischief and they start attacking other hives. So we don't want to do that. Pollen counts. This is also the time of year when people, you end up with a swarm this time of year, and if you end up queenless, you'll be going into winter with a queenless colony. This often happens with some of the biggest and strongest colonies of bees that you have. That's why it's such a puzzle that this big colony goes into winter, and then in the spring they're all dead. What happened? And there's thousands of dead bees on the bottom of that hive on the bottom board. What happened to them? Well, they died from attrition. If there's no queen when they go into wintertime because they swarmed late and their queen didn't get to mate, the replacement queen, then there's just bees dying every day. And if it's really cold outside, they aren't flying out and dying the way they normally would. That's why now they're all piled up inside the hive instead of flying out and dying in a field somewhere where you wouldn't see them. So keep up with that and make sure that your queen right going into wintertime. So I know this seems like it's early because here we are in August, but it actually isn't. Time is going to fly. We only have August and September in a meaningful way for them to get their resources up here in the Northeastern United States. You want to know what your area provides as far as resources for your bees and what your dearth periods are for your specific area? Write this down. Beescape.org. B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E dot org. And you'll put in your information and you're going to find out if you have a dearth when it happens. Historical data that's very good for you and specific to your location. So bring replacement frames of drawn comb. That stuff is gold. And at the end of the year, by the way, if you think it's the time of year to put in foundation that is not drawn out with comb, it isn't. 
it's rare that at the end of the year they'll actually draw new comb because they're in conservation mode and all they want to do is store everything. So if you want them to stay and build resources, you have to provide drawn comb. If you don't have any of that, is there a substitute? There is. It's called Better Comb and it's sold by Better Bee. And that comb, it's a synthetic beeswax. The bees will use it for honey stores and uh, they'll use it right away. Whereas with, if you just put in a heavy wax foundation from Acorn or Premier or something like that, then they have to draw it out. They tend not to do that. And instead you might end up with a swarm too. So um, put that in there. And by the way, that comb comes in medium frames or deeps. So there you go. Uh, pull every frame, blah, blah, blah. Mite counts, covered that. Clean and prep your honey tools. So if you've got an extractor, if you've got any capping tanks and stuff like that, and maybe you're a little behind and you didn't clean it all up and it's not all ready to be used, do all of that, stage everything ahead of time, put down trash bags on the floor or plastic or whatever you do to protect your flooring while you're gonna process honey. Make sure you have all the tools you need. Make sure you have plenty of bottles because here's another thing. I highly recommend that backyard beekeepers do not put this late season honey, aster, goldenrod, and other stuff. You don't want to leave that in those five gallon buckets. You want to get that. You leave them in those buckets overnight because the bubbles raise and some of the detritus and stuff that's in with it might go to the top. But you want to get that into your jars as quick as possible. And the reason is that stuff can start crystallizing fairly quick, especially for those who are not doing a lot of filtering. So if you don't have like a 200 micron filter that you're running everything through or a screen, then there are particulates in the honey that will cause the crystals to form and then you'll start to get set honey. It's much more difficult to work with that in these larger pails and buckets and things like that than it is to have it in the jars ready to go. This is crystallized honey right there and that's because it's goldenrod and aster honey that honey is fantastic and it's very easy to warm that again but warming a bucket is a much bigger challenge than just warming individual jars as you need them so think about that get your honey jars because by the way i don't know where you shop i don't know if you go to aldi's or wherever you go but uh when they have those ball mason jars on sale get them because over the past couple of years they have been in big demand there's a lot of fakes on the market so get the real deal and get this stuff ready to go and uh that's it keep an eye out for skunks and uh, that's if you see a bunch of packed down grass and stuff around your hives you don't want predators to be harassing your bees Raccoons have been easily routed by the noisemakers that I have out. Uh, those motion detected uh, ultrasonic noise making systems that uh, only come on at night. The raccoons, I have lots of video of them showing up, the alarm going off and the raccoon running away. I don't know what the raccoon was gonna do, don't care. He was gonna climb on the hive, but change his mind, they don't like noise. Uh, the skunks have been also thwarted. Also, if you don't have an electric fence for bears, remember that at the end of the year, the bears' appetites are going up. So where we live, I'm in Grand Central Station for black bears. And uh, on Facebook and other social media, everybody always writes where they just saw a mother, where they just saw some cubs. They're over on this road. They're over in this field. Um, so you need to think about having your hives protected. Uh, I think it's interesting that the Apame hives have all these clamps on them that might slow down a bear. But electric fencing is number one. I've uh, gotten rid of my electric fence for years now. And I think that the bears are not liking the noises coming from my motion activated uh, noisemakers. And uh, I keep those. I have some in reserve too. If I walk through there and one of them's even marginally not working, I replace them. So noisemakers, have them. Be ready for bears and stuff. Don't be one of those people that's showing pictures of all of your hives torn apart by some bear who pulled frames and hauled them out in a field to finish eating. So that's it. Uh, I hope that you learned something today. I hope that you're prepared for the season and for what's coming ahead. 
And I want to thank you for watching me and spending time here as I always uh, am glad that you're here and have a fantastic weekend with your bees. Thanks for watching.